Now let's take these three readings from the word of God. First from John chapter 1. The next day John saw Jesus coming towards him and said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is the one I meant when I said a man who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but the reason I came baptizing with water was that he might be revealed to Israel. Then John gave this testimony. I saw the Spirit come down from heaven as a dove and remain on him. I would not have known him, except that the one who sent me to baptize with water told me, the man on whom you see the Spirit come down and remain is he who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. I have seen and testify that this is the Son of God. Two things you need. Have your sins taken away by the Lamb of God and be baptized in the Holy Spirit. Both are needed to be a proper Christian. Let's now turn to the book of Acts. Chapter 19. While Apollos was at Corinth, Paul took the road through the interior and arrived at Ephesus. And there he found some disciples and asked them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? They answered, no, we have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. So Paul asked, then what baptism did you receive? John's baptism, they replied. And Paul said John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. He told the people to believe in the one coming after him, that is, in Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized into the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul placed his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them. And they spoke in tongues and prophesied. There were about 12 men in all. Did you notice it wasn't just enough to believe? They needed to receive the Holy Spirit. And finally, the little letter to Titus, chapter 3, verse 2. At one time, we too were foolish, disobedient, deceived, and enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures. We lived in malice and envy, being hated and hating one another. But when the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared, he saved us, not because of righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us generously, the word is copiously, through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that having been justified by his grace, we might become heirs, having the hope of eternal life. This is a trustworthy saying, and I want you to stress these things so that those who have trusted in God may be careful to devote themselves to doing what is good. These things are excellent and profitable for everyone. Once again, there's a combination of two things. Forgiveness and receiving the Holy Spirit. That's my theme. Now, I don't know if you know that in your Bible, in the New Testament, there are two Baptists. Did you know that Baptists went back right as far as the Bible? You've heard of one, John the Baptist. But I wonder how many of you have ever heard of the other. It was his cousin, Jesus the Baptist. They are both given the same title. Both John and his cousin Jesus are called the Baptist in your New Testament. John became a Baptist about four years before his cousin Jesus. Actually, the word is not a noun. It is literally John the baptizer and Jesus the baptizer. The New, De New Testament never talks about the baptism of the Spirit. It talks about being baptized. It's always verbal. And a verb is something dynamic and moving. A noun is something static and fixed. So John was the baptizer and Jesus was also called the baptizer. And it was a nickname, not a name. And it was not a nickname about what either of them were, but about what both of them did. That's why it's a verb. And so the first thing I've got to teach you this morning is what the word baptize means. It is never translated into the English language. Your Bible simply has the Greek word transliterated, which means not translated, but simply spelled in English letters. Did you know there was a law in England against translating the Greek word baptize? You can only say it in the Greek fashion. It's like rendezvous in French. That's a French word meaning meet you. But we still use the French word transliterated into English letters. So what does baptize, the Greek word, actually mean? In very simple terms, it means to put a solid into a liquid. And of course, we do that every day. You have a bath, you're putting a solid into a liquid. In the Greek language, they used to use it to things like this. A ship that sank at sea was said to be baptized. A solid had been put into a liquid. Now, when we hear of a ship being baptized, we think of the queen breaking a bottle of champagne over her bows and saying, may God bless all who sail in her. But the Greeks only use it when a ship is sunk. Do you remember when the Coronia went down in the Bay of Biscay a few years back? Greek headlines in the newspapers, Coronia baptized, sunk. They used it when they dyed wool in a colored dye. And you had to make sure that every bit of the wool went under into the dye. You baptized wool to make it a different color. You used it when you had a party. There would be a huge bowl of fruit punch or something a bit stronger. And each person was given a cup and they would take a cup and put it in the liquid and bring it up full. They were said to baptize the cup. If you went to a Greek Orthodox church, even today, anywhere in Greece or elsewhere, you'd find that when they baptize a baby, they push it three times right under the water. They have to have a font that big. If you go to some old churches of England, you'll see a font that big. That's so that the baby can be baptized. A solid put right in a liquid. A Greek church could never moisten their forehead and call that baptism because it means immersion. It means to be soaked, to be saturated through and through. 
It's a wonderful word. And that's why they called John the Baptizer. It was a nickname. It means John the Dipper. It means John the Plunger or John the Immerser. That's what the word means. And it was purely to defend moistening the forehead that British law says that you can't translate the word into English. In every other language, the word is translated into something like dip or plunge or sink or soak or saturate. A solid right inside a liquid. Now that's got that word out of the way. And of course, John the Baptist, we are told, did this at a certain point on the River Jordan. Now when you go and see the Jordan, you'll get a shock. It's what we would call a stream. It's a little river and it's a very dirty river. And you think, how on earth did John the Baptizer, John the Dipper use this? But at a certain point in the river, there is a deep pool. You know how rivers sometimes slow down and make a deep pool. And we're told in John chapter 3, you knew verse 16, but I wonder how many of you knew this verse in John 3. John was baptizing at Enon near Salim because there was much water there. Nothing could be plainer. In Acts 8, the Ethiopian eunuch, when he was baptized, said to Philip, see, here is water. What hinders me to be baptized? And it says they both went down into the water. It is very clear that baptized means one thing and one only, to be put right into a liquid, soaked, saturated, covered completely. And that's what many of you know it does mean. Well, now, John immersed in water because he had a special job to do. He had been told the king is coming. The kingdom is very near. And they had been waiting 400 years and more for this, indeed a 1,000 years. Because a 1,000 years earlier, the Jews had been promised a king, the son of David, who would bring the kingdom to Israel. And they'd waited a 1,000 years. But 400 years previously, God stopped talking to them. And they never had a prophet for 400 years. They never heard from God for four centuries. And each generation told their children one day... One day the king will come, and before he gets here, there will be a prophet to tell us he's on his way. They waited 400 years. No wonder when the prophet John, the baptizer, came, the whole nation went out. They'd waited four centuries to hear from God, and here's a man. A man from God saying, the king's coming, the kingdom's coming. Get your life cleaned up. You see, if you knew that Her Majesty the Queen was coming to visit your house, what would you do? I'll guarantee the first thing the wives would do would be to tell their husbands to get the vacuum cleaner out. To clean the place up, royalty is going to visit. If the queen were coming to a service here, my, you'd, you'd be having everything spick and span. You'd really get the carpet out, and uh, wouldn't you? And John's message was, the king is coming, get cleaned up. But he didn't say, get your houses cleaned up. He said, get the inside cleaned up. Because the king is coming, and he's going to clean the situation up when he comes. Better for you to get cleaned up now than have him say, look at your dirty life. And so he baptized to get people cleaned up. And he baptized in that dirty river. And you think when you see it, how can people get cleaned up in that? But it was what we call a sacrament. The Bible doesn't call it that, I'm calling it that, because a sacrament is a physical event with a spiritual effect. Baptism is a sacrament. It does something to you. Not physical. As Peter says in his letter, we're baptized not to clean our bodies up, but to get a clean conscience. That's what baptism does for you. It gives you a clean conscience. And you can only get a clean conscience if you've dealt with the dirt first. And that's why John the Baptist said there are conditions for being baptized in water. The first is that you confess that you're dirty. That you say, I need cleaning up. And that you actually name the things that have made your life dirty. Confession is never general in scripture. It's never, I must have sinned because everybody does. That kind of confession is worthless. Confession is, I have done this. I have thought that. I have felt the other. It is naming sins. And he said, the first thing you do is confess your sins before I baptize you. You've got to admit you're dirty. No point in having a bath until you've admitted that. Second, he said, you must repent, which means putting right what can be put right. It means ending wrong relationships. The Pharisees came and wanted to be baptized. He said, you? You want to be baptized? You're not even confessing your sins yet. He said, bring forth fruit worthy of repentance. And they said, what do you mean? Well, he said, if you've got too many clothes, give some away. If you're cooking your financial books, get your finance straightened out. Very practical is repentance, isn't it? It's something you do, not something you whip tears over. That's regret or even remorse. Repentance is putting right what can be put right. So they had to confess what was wrong, put right what was, could be put right, and then they were ready for a bath to get a clean conscience. They were ready for forgiveness of sins. You're not ready for forgiveness of sin until you've repented and confessed. Then the water worked. See, baptism doesn't always work. There are certain conditions that are needed for it to be a sacrament. And John was promising, you repent, you confess, and when I plunge you into this water, God will use it to clean your inside, and you'll come up out of that water with a clean conscience. I've had many times when somebody I've baptized has done just that and come out of the water clean. In fact, uh, Cliff Richard, when I baptized him, he wrote in his autobiography later, David Pawson washed me, rinsed me, and hung me up to dry, (laughs) and he said, I never felt so clean in all my life. That's what baptism is for. It's a bath for dirty people, and it's a burial for dead people, for people whose old life is finished, people who've turned away from the lifestyle they've been living, and leaving it behind, that's now dead and gone. So we have a burial. And when you combine a bath and a burial, you've got baptism. So that was John. But he knew perfectly well that his baptism was not a permanent cure. He could get people clean, but he couldn't keep them clean. He could deal with their past, but not their future. The problem is, if you've got your conscience clean and you've cleaned up your lifestyle, how are you going to keep that up? Won't you just get dirty again quickly afterwards? And the answer is yes. Baptism only deals with your past and cleans up your past. It doesn't clean up your future. 
And John recognized that. He could get people ready for the king of righteousness to come, get them cleaned up from their past. But how do you keep them clean then? And he said, you'll need another baptism from someone else. I can't do it for you. But to quote a well-known commercial, but I know someone who can. And he constantly told everybody he baptized in water, you'll need two baptisms. And there's a man coming after me who can give you the other baptism that you need that will keep you clean, that will clean up your future as well as your past. That was his message. And he said that to everybody who came, it says, I can only baptize you in water, and that's all I can do. But you need to be baptized in Holy Spirit, or if you like, clean spirit. You probably use spirit to dry clean your clothes. Well, you need Holy Spirit if you're going to stay clean, because you won't manage it yourself, that's for sure. Getting your past dealt with is only halfway, and of itself will not prevent you. I remember the first time I sinned after I was baptized in water, I was so disappointed. I thought, now I'm going to live a clean life, and it hasn't worked. I didn't then realize that baptism in water only deals with your past. It does clean that up. Start the Christian life with a good bath and feel clean. That's what it's meant. That's why Jesus told us to do it. He, he wasn't thinking, what can I do as a test of their discipleship? I know. I'll see if they're willing to get soaking wet in front of everybody else. That's not what it's all about. And too many people think it's just a testimony to other people. It's nothing of the kind. It's starting life clean. And he will use that water. That's why somebody said to Ananias, said to Paul, what are you waiting for? Rise and be baptized and have your sins washed away. I believe baptism works. It does clean up the inside of people. That's what it's for. It's to give them a clean start in the Christian life, but it won't keep them clean. You need another baptism for that. And John said, I can't do it for you, but he will. At the time he said it first, he didn't know who that person was going to be. He got a shock when his cousin Jesus came and said, baptize me, because already everybody knew that Jesus was living a totally clean life. And John said, you should be baptizing me, which shows that John had never been baptized himself. He baptized hundreds of others, but he hadn't been baptized himself. He said, you should be baptizing me. And Jesus said, no, it's right to do what's right. And any Christian who makes the excuse today, I don't need to be baptized in water, must face the fact that Jesus found it necessary for himself, not to get cleaned up, but to be obedient to God. That leaves anybody else without a single excuse, doesn't it? In the normal Christian birth in the New Testament, as I've explained in my book of that title, baptism in water normally precedes baptism in spirit. God is entitled to make exceptions, but that's the normal rule. Well, now let's move on. John knew first that the king was coming, but I don't think he knew who it was. And he knew that somebody else would be a Baptist, a baptizer, but not in water, but in the Holy Spirit. And he didn't know who it was. But what he did know was, God said, when you see the Holy Spirit come down from heaven and rest and remain on someone you baptize, that's the one who's going to bring the other baptism. And he said, I saw it happen. And he not only saw the dove come down, but he heard a voice that people thought was like a thunderclap. When God speaks out loud, it is very loud. And it sounds just like a thunderclap. But John could hear the words. The crowd just said, what a thunder. But John heard the words, this is my beloved son. And I'm very pleased. God was so pleased that Jesus got baptized. How dare any of us displease God by not doing it? Well, John therefore said two things about Jesus. He said, this is the Lamb of God that will take away the sin of the world, and this is the one who can baptize you in the Holy Spirit. That is at the beginning of every one of the four Gospels. And yet I've heard so many preachers talk about the Lamb that takes away the sin of the world, and so few saying that he's the one who baptized in the Holy Spirit. Isn't that crazy? More than that, only in one of the Gospels is it said he's the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. But in all four, he is the one who baptized in the Holy Spirit. More than that, when John said he is the Lamb that takes away the sin of the world, he only said that once in a private conversation. Whereas when he said this is the one who baptized in the Spirit, it says he says it to everybody. Now what's gone wrong with the church? That somehow got the balance all the other way. Always talking about the Lamb of God taking away the sin of the world and the cross, but never talking about Jesus the Baptist. I'm trying to redress the balance this morning. You need two things to get to heaven. You need forgiveness and holiness. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. I mean, if, you'd, if you weren't holy before you got to heaven, you'd ruin it very quickly for yourself and everybody else because it's a holy place. Actually, I don't talk much about heaven. I talk about the new heaven and the new earth because that's where we're going to live. And anything that would pollute that new universe will not be allowed in. If you went to heaven as you are, if I went to heaven as I am, you can come and worship just as you are, but you can't go to heaven just as you are because we'd ruin it and pollute it. If I went as I am now, it would not be heaven for you or anybody else. So we need two things. We need forgiveness and holiness. The first is the work of the second person of the Trinity, Jesus. The other is the work of the third person, the Holy Spirit. You need both, which means in simple terms that to live the Christian life, you need to receive two persons, the second and third person of the Trinity. You need Jesus and you need the Holy Spirit. And it is clear from scripture that you can have one without the other. That's a very important point. You read Acts chapter eight if you want to know. There were some people who had re repented of their sins, believed in Jesus, been baptized in water, were full of joy. And yet it says, but none of them had received the Holy Spirit. So Peter and John came down from Jerusalem to pray for them. This is unheard of that somebody believes in Jesus but hasn't received the Spirit. We must put the situation right immediately. 
I have to say that I believe there are dozens, hundreds, thousands in our churches who've received Jesus but don't know how to receive the Holy Spirit. And that's only half your salvation. It's only half of what it takes to be a Christian. Yes, you've invited Jesus into your life. You've trusted him to take your sins away. But you're going to need more. There is a third person and his work is absolutely essential to live the Christian life. You need two baptisms. You need two persons who will then make you like God himself in whose image you were first created. Now then, Jesus did many wonderful things during his lifetime. He healed the sick, cast out demons, stilled the storm, fed 5,000 with a few fish and loaves. He did amazing things, but not once did he baptize anyone in the Spirit. Did you ever notice that? John had said, he will baptize you in the Holy Spirit, he will baptize you in the Holy Spirit. I can't do that for you, but he will. And he never did while he was on earth. Never once. I wonder if people noticed that. If they asked him, it does say that he was constantly talking about being baptized in the Spirit. Did you know that? He was always talking about it, but he never did it. Until the last night of his life before he died, he said, I'm going to talk to you now about the Holy Spirit. Another comforter. That's not a very nice word. It speaks of hot water bottles and cotton wool to me. Comforter in scripture is the Greek word parakletos or paraklete, which means simply stand beside. Lovely word. I'm going to send you someone else who will stand beside you. And he then said a very interesting thing. He has been with you, but he will be in you. He has been alongside you already, but he wants to be inside you. And that's a real big step. Now, the Holy Spirit had been alongside the 12 apostles. After all, they'd gone out and healed the sick and cast out demons. And they couldn't have done that in their own power. The Holy Spirit was beside them because Jesus was beside them and the Holy Spirit was in Jesus. But he said on that last night, the Holy Spirit wants to be inside you, not just beside you in me. When you've got Christ, you've got the Holy Spirit beside you in Christ. But you need him inside. And that's a big change. The 12 disciples didn't have that yet. So he promised that on the night he died. Then on the first night of his resurrection, when he came back to them, again, he talks to them about the Holy Spirit. And he gives them a sign and a command. Now, I want you to know this. Nothing happened then. He said, here is the sign. <laughs> and he blew on each of them. And then after he had blown, he gave them a command, an imperative command. Receive the Holy Spirit. And nothing happened. There is no record of them receiving. And in fact, out of 12 apostles, two of them were missing that night. Judas was missing. Thomas was missing. So did they miss out on something? No. The other 10 would tell them when he came back, we've been given a sign and a command. When Jesus blows on us, we must receive. It was a rehearsal for something that would happen 10 days later. That's all it was. There is no record of anything happening at that point. He blew on them and then commanded them, now you receive. Had they received then, he'd have told them to receive first and then he'd blown on them. But he didn't. He blew, then he told them to receive. And they knew that the next time Jesus blew on them, they must surrender and receive what he was giving. Six weeks later, he, he left them and went back to his home in heaven. And he said, now wait, wait. You will be baptized in the Holy Spirit not many days from now. And it was 10 days. 10 days later, nine o'clock in the morning, they're all in the temple, not the upper room. They're in the house of God, praying, very public place. 120 of them, including Mary, the mother of Jesus. Did you ever hear a preacher tell you that she spoke in tongues? Well, she did. And his brothers were now, instead of teasing him about his messianic syndrome, now they're there praying. And the 10 are there, and Thomas is now there, and now they've elected another Matthias to replace Judas. They're all there, 120 all together. And there they were, nine o'clock in the morning. And now, at last, they were baptized in the Holy Spirit by a Jesus in heaven. He never did it while he was on earth. He said, I have to go back before he can come. I've got to be up there for this to happen down here. And Jesus could only do it after he went back to heaven. That's why I said he became a Baptist four years or thereabouts after John, his cousin. But he was baptizing in the Holy Spirit. And now it happened, and for the first time in human history, a group of people were baptized in the Holy Spirit by Jesus back in heaven. I'm sure you know this story well enough for me not to have to go through it, but there was an outside of it and an inside. The outside was wind and fire sitting on each of them. Now, that never happened again in the New Testament, so far as we know. It has happened since. I was in a meeting of about 120 people in a Bible college in this country, and foolishly, I closed my eyes in prayer. We have got into a habit of doing that. They never did that in the Bible. They lifted their eyes up to heaven. And I closed my eyes and somebody told me afterwards, not just one person, that a tongue of fire sat on each head in that meeting. And they sent me an advertisement for a gas cooker with a ring of flames saying, this is what it looked like. And I missed it. Now when I'm praying, I tend to open my eyes to see what's happening. And then Billy Graham was on his way to Scotland for his first crusade in Glasgow. And he'd been told that the Scots were a dour lot, having fed on porridge for years. And that they would not respond to his emotional appeal. So he and his fellow evangelists got into a railway carriage compartment, pulled the blinds down and got on their knees to pray about the Glasgow Crusade. And Billy Graham records in his autobiography that the sound of a rushing mighty wind filled the railway compartment. And they knew it was going to be all right. But those are special things that don't occur regularly. But the inside, what happened to them on the inside, that's what we're concerned about. That's what we're going to ask about. Is it for you today? Well, now what happened on the inside? They were filled to overflowing with the Holy Spirit. 
Now, let's just look at that. I stopped to get some petrol on the way here. I was running out. And how do I know when the petrol tank is full? Well, we have the automatic pump now that shuts itself up. But you didn't used to have that. How did you know your petrol tank was full when it overflowed out of the little hole at the back of your car? How do you know when anybody is full of anything? Well, God has provided you with an overflow. There's a little overflow in my bath at home. And I tend to do a lot of meditation in the bath. Do you? I really can. I'm, I'm facing the right way. I'm relaxed. I've got a dish area around me to pick up messages from up there. And I can get a whole book in a bath. I can stay there till the water's stone cold. You see, it must be my theology. I've never been able to meditate in a shower. <laughs> but when I'm immersed, I can really meditate. That's by the by. But there's an overflow just below the taps. There are two taps and then there's a hole. And if, if you get the bath full, there's a horrible noise. Of <laughs> now, God provided every one of you with an overflow. It's about an inch and a quarter below your nose. So put your finger on your nose and just work down and you'll find the overflow. And Jesus said, whatever your heart is full of will come out here. That's a sobering word. That's why more people have sinned with their mouth than any other part of their body. In fact, I heard of a vicar who told his congregation, I'm now going to show you that part of my body that brings me the most temptations. And there was a deadly hush. And then he went, well, whatever your heart is full of will come out of your mouth, said Jesus. If you're full of fear, you cry out. Oh, if you're full of anger, where does it come out? If you're full of fun, where does it come out? You laugh, you just laughed a few minutes ago. That's because you were filled with humor, filled with fun, and it comes out. Whatever your heart is full of will come out of your mouth, said Jesus. And so when you're full of the Holy Spirit, the sure and certain sign is something will come out of your mouth. And that's exactly what happened on the day of Pentecost. They were all filled. Jesus had said, you will all be baptized in the Holy Spirit. Now they were all filled, same thing, filled to overflowing. And they began, they burst into worship and praise, just exploded. The only thing was they were using languages they'd never learned. I hate the word tongues. Sounds like uncontrolled babbling. Languages is the word that's used here. They extol the mighty works of God in languages they had never learned. But then God knows all the languages, doesn't he? And somebody full of his spirit can speak any language on earth. And even any language in heaven, tongues of men or of angels. So they exploded in praise to God in unknown languages. Of course, 120 people doing that makes a big noise. And everybody else in the temple heard it. <laughs> they said, they must be drunk. You don't behave like that in, in temples. Just as people today say, you don't behave like that in church. And they said they're drunk. And that's when Peter said, drunk at nine o'clock in the morning? Unheard of. This is what Joel predicted. This is the spirit of prophecy introducing the prophethood of all believers. That's what it was. And the spirit of prophecy was being poured out on all kinds of people, regardless of age, sex, or class. As Joel had said, age, sex, or class doesn't matter here. The Holy Spirit is poured out on all flesh, all kinds of flesh. Well, every year since, churches have celebrated and remembered that event because it was foundational to the Christian church, to all Christian living. So 120 people knew what it meant to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. It was an experience. A conscious experience. They knew when it happened. They could date it. It happened on the Jewish feast of Pentecost. The very feast that remembered that God had sent the commandments through Moses on Sinai on that very day. Not just 10 of them, but 613 of them. God had given his commandments. And the immediate result at Sinai was that 3,000 people died for breaking those commandments. That's in the book of Exodus. 3,000 died when the law was given. But when the spirit was given, 3,000 were saved. And that's why Paul later said, the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. When churches are under rules and regulations and under letter... It kills. Legalism has killed more churches than license. But when the spirit is there, the freedom of the spirit, that's life. There are dead churches and there are live churches. And the spirit is what makes the difference. Not only did they know when it happened, but everybody else present knew when it happened. That's the mark of later baptisms in the spirit. Not only do the people know, but anybody around knows. I was sitting in a public park in the town of Brasilia, the new capital of Brazil. Lovely missionary dedicated to his work, but he confessed sadly that he'd never experienced supernatural power, that he wistfully talked about the Holy Spirit, didn't really know. He said, would you pray for me? And there in the public park with families picnicking all around, I just laid a hand on him and said, Lord, this dear man has served you so faithfully, but all in his own strength. Please give him your power. And he opened his mouth. He was filled to overflowing. The man was full. And all the families turned around and looked at him. <laughs> and I sort of shrank away from him. <laughs> I'm not, I don't belong to him. <laughs> and then he looked at me and he said, is that it? I said, well, it sounds like it to me. I said, I'll bet you've never done that in your life, especially in public. You're a real reserved Englishman. He said, I've never done such a thing before. But the proof of it was that within 24 hours, he had healed two sick people, which he'd never done before. It was an explosion. He was filled to overflowing. And that's all that came out. But it was good enough for me because it was good enough for God. The man was full, filled to overflowing. Well, now, years later, Peter didn't say we were baptized in the Holy Spirit or filled with the Holy Spirit. He simply said, that's when we received the Holy Spirit. I want to make this quite clear. In your Bible, in mine, receiving the Holy Spirit, being baptized in the Holy Spirit, being filled with the Holy Spirit are all one and the same thing. And when Paul asked the disciples in Ephesus, did you receive the Spirit when you believed in Jesus? This is what he meant. When he wrote to Titus and said, we've been justified by faith, saved through justification by faith, and through the Spirit being poured out upon us copiously. That's what he meant. 
The language they used, they talked about the Spirit falling on us, poured out upon us, anointing us, filling us. Oh, they exhausted the dictionary to try and describe this amazing experience. But it's all referring to one and the same, with one exception. There would be later occasions when they were filled, but they didn't use the other language. They used anointed for the one only first pouring out. They used filled for repeated experiences of being filled to overflowing. That's the only word that is used for later experiences of the Holy Spirit. And I believe we should stick to the way the Bible uses words. So there it was. It was an event. But it was an event with effects. And I'm just going to mention five major effects of what this did for them. They, they just were never the same again. There were five areas in their lives that were radically changed after the day of Pentecost, after they'd been baptized in the Spirit. Number one, they now had confidence. Confidence. Time and again it says they were filled with the Spirit and spoke the Word of God with boldness. Confidence. They were first of all confident in themselves. They had an assurance. Do you want to be sure that God has forgiven you? Do you want to be sure that you're a child of God? You won't get that assurance from Scripture. Too many evangelicals try to. They say, well, the Bible says so, I believe it, so it must be so. That's a kind of process of mental deduction. The assurance that the New Testament talks about does not come from Scripture, but from the Spirit. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirits that we are the children of God. John says, hereby we know that we are children of God because he has given us of his Spirit. It is the Spirit's job to make you sure that you're a child of God. And sure enough, that's what happens. My wife is sitting in the front row. And after she got filled with the Spirit, I noticed the confidence that she had. Boldness to speak. And it's not just assurance that you're right with God. It's a boldness in speaking to others. No shrinking, just this is the truth. We know it. And it gave them courage. It gave them the courage not only to live for Christ, but to die for him. That takes confidence, doesn't it? It takes courage. That was the first area of their life that changed. The second was that they now got guidance. They were led by the Spirit. The Spirit told them where to go, what to do. The Spirit took control of their lives. And sometimes he forbade them to go where they were going. Other times he opened a door for them. You know, guidance is one of the biggest problems some Christians seem to have. Trying to find out, trying to second guess God's mind. But the Spirit brings guidance. And as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. It's the Spirit's job to help you to know the mind of Christ for your life. And the Spirit will lead. And now they had guidance. Thirdly, they had power. They could do things they could never have done otherwise. Supernatural power. They're called the gifts of the Spirit. And now they could do the things that Jesus had done. And he told them on the last night before he died, the, the works that I do, you will do too. Because the miracles Jesus did were not done because he was the Son of God. They were done because he was the Son of Man working with the Holy Spirit. He never did a miracle until he was 30 years of age. He couldn't. He never actually preached until he was 30 years of age. He couldn't. Because he was as real a human being as you and I are. And therefore, he was dependent on the Holy Spirit. He said, if I, by the Spirit of God, cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Jesus never claimed credit for his miracles. He, he attributed it to the power of the Holy Spirit. And that's why he was able to say, the things I've been doing, you will be doing. Impossible. No, it's not. And that's why people who get baptized in the Spirit begin to see miracles happening. The fourth thing they had after Pentecost was unity. Unity. They called it the fellowship of the Spirit. The Greek word koinonia is something much closer than having a cup of tea together. We had a church secretary who every Sunday used to say, do come and have fellowship in a cup of tea with us afterwards. And we had visions of all the church members piling into a big cup, <laughs> having fellowship in a cup of tea. <laughs> but you know, that's not fellowship, that's just friendship. Fellowship is where you have something that joins you closely together. It was used of Siamese twins who shared the same bloodstream. And I have found this, that people are talking about the unity in the church all over the place. It is not ever to be achieved by bringing us all into one denomination or one construction organization, nor is it achieved by agreeing on all doctrine. Some people think that if you present each other with a list of your doctrines and say, you agree with that, we can have fellowship. It's not the way. In the Bible, you have koinonia with everybody who has been filled with the Spirit, the same Spirit you have. And that is the first step towards doctrinal unity or organizational unity. That's the first step. Paul in Ephesians 4 says, maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace until we all attain to the unity of the faith. It was a shock to me when I discovered Roman Catholics had been baptized in the Spirit. I thought, but I can't have fellowship with them. They teach this, 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 and this. And I make it quite clear that I can't agree with all Catholic teaching. I don't. But I found I could have koinonia with Catholics who had received the Spirit. I think of dear father Ian Pettit, now in glory. Did any of you meet him? Loved Jesus more than anyone I knew. I, was in a, I shared a bedroom with him at a conference. And I said, Ian, I really hope that my room in heaven is next door to yours. <laughs> I never thought I'd ever say that to a Roman Catholic. But the unity of the Spirit comes first. And when you meet somebody who's been filled with the same spirit in you, you share the same bloodstream, you share the same air that you breathe, and you can have fellowship. That's the answer to the unity of the church, for us all to get filled with the spirit. We can work out the doctrine later. I was preaching to about 60 priests in a Roman Catholic seminary with a cardinal sitting in the front row, and they gave me my choice of title, so I chose as my title, What the Bible Doesn't Say About Mary. Now, that was sticking my neck out, but I did tell them what the Bible does say about Mary. And I said, we Protestants are frightened to talk about Mary, lest anybody think we're going Catholic. I said, you've said too much and we say too little. Let's get back to what the Bible really says. I said, for one thing, she spoke in tongues. That again caused a bit of a gas. <laughs> but you see, there she is. But I said, from the day she spoke in tongues on, she became an ordinary member of the congregation. Her special job was finished. 
But you see, I could talk like that because Ian Pettit himself came and he wept on my shoulder afterwards. He said, for the first time, I understand why you Protestants have problems about us Catholics. But you see, we were now able to maintain the unity of the spirit until we attained the unity of the faith. And the early disciples had a unity. They had their disagreements, but there was a unity there that they called the fellowship of the spirit, the Siamese twins sharing the same source of life. And finally, fifthly, purity. They now discovered they could live pure lives. They could be holy. They could live like God. They could now obey the command of both the Old and the New Testament. Be holy, for I am holy, says the Lord. They found they could do it. Now, you try from now until next Sunday to live a holy life in your own strength. And you can come to confession next Sunday morning. Ever tried to live holy lives by yourself? You'll never make it. And it's no good being told what you can, like the man sent to prison at 70 for life. And he said to the governor, I'll never make it, I'll never make it. And the governor said, don't mind, just do what you can. It's amazing how many people think that's what we're called to be holy. Do what you can. And God will forgive what you can't. But through the Holy Spirit, they found they could live. They called it the fruit of the Spirit. They found that the Spirit could reproduce the character of Christ in them. They could become like Jesus. The fruit of the Spirit is only one fruit with nine flavors. You can't have any one of the flavors without the other eight. There is a fruit in Spain called deliciosis. You take a bite, it tastes like an orange. You take another bite, it tastes like a grapefruit. It's got all the different flavors of fruit in one fruit. And the fruit of the Spirit has nine flavors. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, meekness, and self-control. And they're all descriptions of Jesus. And the Holy Spirit, if you walk in the Spirit, he will reproduce all those nine things. You can find some of them in unbelievers. You'll never find all of them together in an unbeliever. Because only the Holy Spirit in a believer can produce all together. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, meekness, self-control. Do you notice that the first three get you right with God? The next three get you right with everybody else. And the last three sort yourself out. So you get into good relationships with God, other people, and yourself through the Holy Spirit. Now then, it's time to talk about us today. I've been talking about there and then. Now it's here and now. We've got to ask some big questions. Don't we need these very same five things? Would you not agree these are the greatest needs in the church today? These five effects, there are many more I could have, but I'm short of time. These five effects are urgently needed, but how are we going to get them? How can we have the effects without the event? That's a big question. Or to put it differently, was Pentecost the first and last time it ever happened? Or has it happened again? Could it happen now? Or are we just every Whit Sunday celebrating the birthday of the church that's now over? Are we just looking back to something? rather than sharing in it. Most churches on which Sunday look back. They don't talk about having it now. They say, wasn't this a wonderful event that set the church going? Full stop. Alas, now I've entered into an area of controversy. And I'm going to be very honest with you and share that there are three major different views on the question, did Pentecost happen again? Very different views. And there are many churches among these three different views. I'm calling them the sacramental, the evangelical, and the Pentecostal. And you must search the scriptures for yourself and come to one of these three views. Don't just listen to preachers and teachers or the denomination in which you were brought up in or your background. You must go to the word of God and settle for yourself which of these views is correct. The sacramental view is very simple. Pentecost was never repeated. It was a one-off unique event that got the church going. And that the spirit was then given to the church to reside in the church. And if you want to benefit from that long ago event, you simply do so by joining the church you then enter into a community of the Spirit. And the five effects will show in your life. Now, this view that the Holy Spirit now resides in the church provokes another question, but how do I avail myself of it as an individual? And the answer is through the church's sacraments. The Catholic view of the sacramental approach is that you receive the Holy Spirit when you are baptized as a baby. That that is a double baptism. You're baptized in water and the Spirit at one and the same time. You won't remember either, but later in life you must believe that that's what happened and that that's when you receive the Spirit. The Anglican version of it is that that's what happened in confirmation. And if you listen carefully to the words of the Book of Common Prayer, you'll realize that Anglicans are supposed to believe that in infant baptism or christening, you are born of the Spirit, and in confirmation, you receive the Holy Spirit. And the bishop will actually say that to you when he lays his hands on you, receive the Holy Spirit. Nothing may happen, you may feel nothing, probably will feel nothing, but you must believe that that's when you receive it. Quite frankly, I can't go along with that at all. It's as if I don't get baptized in the Spirit by Jesus, but by some priest. He is the one I need to go to. I believe that is totally contrary to Scripture. Nobody other than Jesus can baptize you in the Holy Spirit. And he couldn't do it till he got back in heaven. But that is the belief. Now, you know, nearly two-thirds of the British population have been christened. Would you say that two-thirds of the British people have received the Holy Spirit? About a quarter of the population have been confirmed in their teens. Would you say that a quarter of our population has received the Holy Spirit? I just find the facts are right against this. My biggest problem is that I believe it's Jesus who does it, not a priest. But that's one view, and probably the majority of church members in this country have been told that they have received the Spirit, either in christening or confirmation, and even though nothing happened, you must believe it. I do know a bishop who was frightened out of his mitre when he said, receive the Holy Spirit, and the person did. <laughs> and they burst out in an unknown language, and they nearly shut out his robes. <laughs> Never seen it happen before. 
Well, it did happen on that one occasion. I know the bishop personally, but normally nothing happens. And after all, if you were christened as an infant, you have no recollection of it, whatever. And it probably means nothing to you, except a certificate with your name on it. That's one view, and I'm sorry if I seem a bit sarcastic, but I just cannot line it up with the New Testament. The second view, many of you will have been familiar with, I call it the evangelical view. And I take a Bible teacher like John Stott as a representative of this view. It is that Pentecost was repeated, but only three more times in the book of Acts. That it happened again with a bunch of Samaritans, and it happened again with a bunch of Gentiles, Cornelius and his household, and that it happened again with John's disciples in Acts 19. But it has only happened four times in history. And they call it the Pentecost of the Jews, the Pentecost of the Samaritans, the Pentecost of uh, Gentiles, and the Pentecost of John's disciples. And therefore, they say, don't expect Pentecost to happen to you. So how then do I tap into the Pentecost event? If the sacramental view says, take the sacraments of the church, the evangelical view is get converted, invite Jesus into your life. And a whole lot of other euphemisms, make a commitment, make a decision. Ask Jesus to take over. None of those phrases occurs in the Bible, but we use them right, left, and center. And the teaching is that when you received Jesus as your Savior and Lord, automatically and usually unconsciously, you receive the Holy Spirit. That's the most common view among evangelicals. And therefore, you cannot use the New Testament language about your conversion. Very few evangelicals talk of your conversion as being baptized in the Spirit. None of them use the word filled about your conversion. None of them talk about the Spirit being poured out on you or fallen upon you. It becomes irrelevant language because how can you describe an unconscious experience with such powerful words? You can't. And so all those words used in the New Testament of baptized in the Spirit are dropped in favor of these unscriptural terms like inviting Jesus into your life and so on. And above all, the New Testament does not talk about receiving Jesus. It did when he was on earth, because you could then invite him into your home. And it says he came to his own people and his own received him not. But as many as received, past tense, him, during the days of his flesh, that is, to them he gave the authority to become sons of God who were born of God, not of the will of flesh of man. But that is all in the past tense of when he was on earth. And he said, then you receive me, you receive him who sent me. But after the, he ascended and the heavens received him from their sight, never again did the apostles talk of receiving Jesus. You can't receive him. He's no longer on earth. He's at the right hand of the Father. What you can receive now and ought to be told to receive is to receive the Holy Spirit who has taken his place on earth. So they never preached receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior. They said believe in Jesus and receive the Holy Spirit. And they added one other thing before both. They said repent toward God, believe in Jesus at his right hand, and receive the Holy Spirit now on earth. So we've got all mixed up in our language. And frankly, it means that many, many Christians in this country don't know if they've received the Holy Spirit or not. There is no event they can point to. There is no Pentecost in their life when the Spirit was poured out upon them, when the Spirit fell upon them. Well, that's the second view, and it was the second most common view in Britain. But I move on. The idea is that Pentecost died out after the apostles, and such a view is often against prophecy and tongues today. These things belong to the past. So I come to the third major view, which is now taking over the world church, and is now becoming the major view in the 21st century, the Pentecostal view. And it starts with a very simple premise. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And therefore, he's doing the same thing in the same way. It's a simple argument. And so this view expected every believer to have their own Pentecost, to tap into the historical event in an existential way. That sounds a bit complicated, doesn't it? The same way that the apostles received the Spirit and everybody else in the New Testament church. When you read the scripture carefully, you find that the apostles expected every believer in the New Testament to have the same event in their lives. Peter said it again and again. He said, I couldn't help but accept Cornelius and his household because they received the Spirit just as we received the Spirit. Same experience, same event, filled to overflowing. Sometimes in unknown languages, sometimes in their known language. Both happen in the New Testament. But an explosion through the mouth of words that came from God. That's what they look for. And they expected it of every believer. That's why Peter and John rushed to Samaria, because they hadn't had that. They'd repented, they believed, they'd been baptized, they were full of joy, but they hadn't had that. So Peter and John rushed down and they prayed for them. And it says, as they prayed for each one, each one received his Pentecost. It was the normal way that the Holy Spirit was received then, and Pentecostals believe now. Pentecost was only the first such occasion. After all, John the Baptist had promised it to everybody he baptized in water. Had he added, of course, it'll only be for those of you who happen to be present on the day of Pentecost. It sounds ridiculous, doesn't it? They would all have rushed on the day of Pentecost. No, he said, I baptize you in water, but he will baptize you in the Holy Spirit. It's a promise to everybody. And indeed, on the day of Pentecost, Peter said, the promise is to you and to your children and to all that are afar off, as many as the Lord calls. The promise of being baptized in the Holy Spirit is universal through time and space. You've already gathered, that's my view. I was driven to it by a study of scripture. Let me give you my testimony. We're nearly through, but I'll share my testimony. I came to know Jesus when I was 17 through my cousin who was an evangelist called Tom Reese in a place called Hildenborough Hall. But I didn't know the Holy Spirit. Through knowing Jesus, I came to know the Father and I knew Father and Son. But if you asked me, did I know the Holy Spirit? I wouldn't have quite known what to say. I certainly didn't know him to talk to him. And so for years, when I was at Cambridge, I did a postgraduate year and I could choose my study. And as one subject, I chose what happened on the day of Pentecost in Acts 2. And I prepared a paper on it. And my conclusion was very learned after quoting Greek and Hebrew scholars. I said, nobody knows. 
and I finished up in complete ignorance. I thought it's too long ago and too far away for anybody today to understand what went on. But I got a good mark for it, quoted the right scholars and threw in a bit of my own stuff. And then I went into the ministry and I preached regularly. But there was one day of the year I didn't like preaching on. It was with Sunday because I could no longer talk about the Father and the Son. I had to produce two sermons on the third person of the Trinity. And I managed it out of books. But, you know, anybody discerning would have realized I was just giving book learning like the scribes. Whereas Jesus always, they recognized that he knew what he was talking about, not like the scribes. Well, it became a crisis. I decided, like many preachers do, it's a naughty decision to settle my doubts in the pulpit. And many preachers do that. The dear old lady said to her vicar, please stop sharing your doubts with us. I have enough of my own. <laughs> but that's what we preachers sometimes do. So I announced that I would preach a series of 20 sermons on the Holy Spirit. And I'd take people through every reference to the Spirit in the Bible from generation to revolution all the way through. And I began the series. I got on very well with the Old Testament. That was far enough away. Talked about the prophets being filled with the Spirit, Samson and all the others. And I got into the first three Gospels. That was okay. Then I got into John, John 14 to 16. I began to feel out of my depth. And I'd arranged to reach Acts 2 on Pentecost Sunday. And I was dreading it now. I thought, I started and I've got to finish. And I thought, what am I going to say on which Sunday on Acts 2? Now, about that time, we had a man in the church who was the self-appointed leader of the opposition. I think there's one in most church. Do you know what I mean? You four. Well, in every church, there's at least one. And dear James, as his name was, or Jimmy, as everybody called him, was the self-appointed leader of the opposition. And in church meetings, if I suggested something, it was either we've done it before and it didn't work, or we've not done it before and we're not changing. And I used to come back from a church meeting, and I would say, oh, Jimmy, Jimmy. And my wife would say, don't worry about Jimmy. He's the only one opposing you. And all the members are with you. Forget him. I said, I can't forget him. Well, I did get relief from him once a year. He had a weak chest, and he would develop hay fever at the right time of year, and then it would turn into lung congestion, and he would be put to bed for up to six weeks. And I have to say that I rejoiced. And we could be without Jimmy. Well, this year came when I'm in the middle of these sermons on the Holy Spirit. And he went down with it. And he was put to bed by the doctor for weeks. And I thought, well, I better go and see him. That's the pastor's duty. So off I went to see him. And he lay there. As I went towards him, I kept hearing in my brain, James 5, James 5, James 5. And I thought, well, he's James, but what's the 5? And then I remembered that James 5 says, is any among you sick? Then go and anoint him with oil and pray for him and the sick will be healed. And I thought, oh, no, Lord, you don't want me to do that for Jimmy. <laughs> I got to him, and there he lay, gray-faced, flat on his back, gasping for breath. And first question, he said, what do you think about James 5? And I said, well, I have been thinking about it. <laughs> Why? He said, because I'm due in Switzerland on Thursday on business. He was a patent office man. And he said, the doctor says I can't go. But he said, would you come and anoint me with oil? I said, I'll pray about it. That's a real get out. You know, Sounds so good. <laughs> and I went home and I said, Lord, tell me why I can't do this. Just give me a good reason why I shouldn't do it. You know? But on the Wednesday, his wife rang me up and she said, are you coming to anoint my husband? I said, all right, I'll come tonight. And I went to Boots the Chemist and bought a big bottle of olive oil. And then I went into the church by myself and knelt in the pulpit to pray for him. Have you ever tried to pray for someone you're glad is sick? I mean, it really is a problem. And I tried to pray. And then suddenly I was praying for Jimmy with all my heart and soul. Really was. But not in English. It sounded like Chinese to me. And I finished that and looked at my watch. And now I had gone just like that. I thought, I wonder if I can do that again. And I bowed my head, thought of him. And I was praying in something like Russian. And I thought, oh boy, this is what happened in Acts 2. This is it. Wonderful things are going to happen tonight. So off I went with a few of the leaders and we got into his bedroom and we took James 5 and we went through it just as if we were servicing a car. And we said, now the first step is confess your sins to one another. So I turned to Jimmy and I said, Jimmy, I've never liked you. That's confessing sins, you see. And he said, well, that's mutual. <laughs> and we went through it all. And then I said, right, now we anoint you. And I took the cork out of the bottle and I poured it all over his head. And uh, guess what happened? Absolutely nothing. And I got up and I said, well, we've done it all. And I turned to run away and I ran as far as the bedroom door. And I just turned back at the door and I said, have you still got your air ticket for tomorrow? He said, yes, of course. I said, I'll run you to the airport. And then I ran. <laughs> and the last thing the next morning I wanted to do was contact him. So I didn't. But at 10 o'clock, the phone went, Jimmy. I said, you're all right. <laughs> Lack of faith. And he said, I'm fine. Can you pick me up at 11? I said, yes. I said, does the doctor say you can go? He said, yes, I've been to him. And he says, I'm clear. I said, what happened? He said, in the middle of the night, it was as if two giant hands squeezed my chest. And I brought up two bucketfuls of liquid. I can breathe. He said, I've been having my hair cut. But the barber said, I'll have to shampoo you first. He said, I've never seen such a greasy head of hair in my life. <laughs> well, I ran him to the airport. Now I'll tell you three things. First, he became my best friend and the man I went to. Second, he and his wife got baptized in the spirit. And third, he never had that problem again. That's not the work of the devil, is it? So there it was. The next Sunday, I'm in the pulpit again, John 16. I gave the same sort of message I've been giving for weeks. And a young carpenter came to me afterwards. He said, what happened to you this week? I said, why? What do, what do you mean? He said, you know what you're talking about now. <laughs> and and he, he, he's now a Baptist minister in Bristol. Well, from then on, I began to be able to do things I'd never done before in my life. The gifts became available. It's a simple story. But look, I'm glad I got baptized in the Spirit without anybody else there, because then I knew it was for him. People think, oh, I must find somebody filled with the Spirit, and then I'll catch it from them. No, nobody else can baptize you in the Spirit except him. He's the first person to go to if you want to receive the Holy Spirit. I was in Jerusalem last week. I was in Gaza actually dodging missiles. But I was in Jerusalem, and I bumped into a man, Pastor Yun, the heavenly man. Have you heard of him? Who's heard of him? Put your hand up. Oh, lots of you. Look, every Christian should read that book. 
You'll never grumble again after you read this. A man who was tortured, electrocuted, had his legs broken, yet walked out of prison and the doors opened in front of him. A man who went without food and water for 74 days. Still alive and full of the Lord. But I, I had not read his book. I was ashamed to confess it to him when we met. We got on like a house on fire. But I'd never read his book. I've read it since. I'm just going to read something out. I wasn't sure who the Holy Spirit was. Now, he was a believer. He'd read his Bible, memorized it. But he said, I wasn't sure who the Holy Spirit was. I ran and asked my mother. She couldn't explain. She simply said, I've already told you all I can remember. Why don't you pray and ask God for the Holy Spirit, just like you prayed for your Bible? My mother was illiterate, and so she had a shallow knowledge of the Bible. She'd learned only to recite a few verses. This was a defining moment in my life. I had a desire for God's presence and power, and now I realized how important it is to know God's written word. I prayed to the Lord, I need the power of the Holy Spirit. I am willing to be your witness. After the prayer, God's spirit of joy fell upon me. A deep revelation of God's love and presence flooded my being. I'd never enjoyed singing before, but many new songs of worship flowed from my lips. They were words I had never learned before. Later I wrote them down, and these songs are still sung in the Chinese house churches to this day. Songs he'd never learned, words he'd never learned, poured out. You notice the liquid language flooded my soul poured out, fallen upon. That was his Pentecost. Immediately he began to be led by the Spirit, to be told where to go, who he'd meet the next day, their names and even the clothes they were wearing, so that he'd recognize them. He was living in the Spirit from then on. And you must read his story. I had to follow him in Jerusalem and speak after he'd spoken to 5,000 Christians from 74 countries. And I thought, follow that. So I just got up and said, now you're going to hear from the earthly man. That's me. <laughs> He's the heavenly man. Well, that was his testimony. So finally, what are the conditions? What do you need to do to be ready to receive the Holy Spirit and be baptized in that wonderful Spirit? First, there are three basic steps that I believe should be taken first. One, repent of all known sin and put right what can be put right. Two, believe in the Lord Jesus as your Savior and Lord. And three, be baptized in water. Those are the three basics. Then the next condition is very simple. Jesus said, ask. But he didn't say ask once. He said, go on asking and you will receive. Go on knocking and you will have the door open. Go on. Go on asking. People have said to me, you know, I once asked to receive the Holy Spirit and nothing happened. You only asked once? Did you mean business? When my children wanted bikes, Daddy, can we have a bike? Daddy, it'll save bus fares. Daddy, everybody at school has bikes. Daddy, 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 daddy. They don't ask once. They go on asking until they get. We had some students in Guildford. They shut themselves in a bedroom, locked the door and said, Lord, we're not leaving this room until you baptize us in your Holy Spirit. By the next morning, they came out. <laughs> Changed. Do you really want this more than anything else? Then you will go on asking until you get. The context of that statement in Luke 11 is of the woman who, or the man who went on knocking at a neighbor's door till he got some bread for his visitors. And Jesus said, that's how you are to pray. How much more will your Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who go on asking him? But I'm going to add three other conditions which are necessary because of today's situation. First, you need to study your Bible and search it asking the Holy Spirit to guide you until you are absolutely convinced from the Word of God that this promise is for you and that Jesus wants to baptize you in the Holy Spirit. Don't just try it out knowing that there are different views in the church. You must have your own conviction based on the Word of God. I'm not interested in people wanting experiences for their own sake. Do you want the courage, the guidance, the power, the purity, the unity? Those are the reasons for asking for the Holy Spirit not just to have a high, and expect to happen what the Bible talks about. The Bible doesn't talk about laughing or dancing or falling on the ground. It talks about exploding through your mouth in praise to God. So you need to have your clear view before you ask. You're claiming a promise. And if you're not sure what that promise is, you can hardly claim it. And then next, we are so full of inhibitions and fears today that you need to deal with them first. I've known people afraid of being a fool, afraid of what they might do when they hand control over to the Spirit, afraid of what people will say if they speak in tongues. I've known all kinds of inhibitions and fears, and particularly the British Reserve it's ten times easier to get somebody with a Spanish temperament to be filled with the Spirit than a good reserved Britishman who's been controlling himself for so long that he's reluctant to let go. And finally, in our situation, we must be willing to be led by the Spirit afterwards, whatever that leads to, whatever the cost or the consequence. A vicar came to me years ago and he said, David, will you pray that I may be filled with the Spirit? I said, yes, but I must first ask you a question. He said, what's that? I said, would you, an Anglican vicar, be willing to be baptized by immersion as a believer if the Holy Spirit tells you to? He said, why do you ask that? I said, I'm just trying to find out if you are willing to be led by the Spirit afterwards. He said, will the Holy Spirit tell me that? I said, he may or he may not. I think he's likely to. But I said, what will you do if he does? He said, can I go away and think about it? He came back three days later and he said, David, I've thought it through. I will do what the Spirit tells me, whatever it costs. And I prayed and he was filled and he went away and I didn't hear of him for 12 years. And then I saw a headline in a national newspaper, vicar and entire church kicked out of the Church of England by a bishop. And it cost him his pension, his vicarage, his job, but he was obedient to the Holy Spirit. Do you just want the experience of being baptized in the Spirit or do you want to walk in the Spirit afterwards and be led by the Spirit? That's the big question. Well, I've tried to teach you from the Word of God. I've shared my testimony. It won't be exactly the same for you, but the explosion of praise will. And now I must leave it with you.